John Carpenter's They Live is a work of pure, unbridled anarchy. A scream of anger at the world, and specifically the United States, done through an exaggerated, often silly lens that lets its frustrated cynicism be palatable and ridiculously enjoyable. Watch a few Carpenter movies and it won't be long until the director's worldview is clear. There's not much hope for humanity, authority should not be trusted, and the good things in life should never be taken for granted. And it's here in They Live which Carpenter made in the midst of becoming increasingly frustrated with the studio system and America, that the master of horror let it all out. By the late 80s, I'd had enough, and I decided I had to make a statement, as stupid and banal as it is. But I made one, and that's They Live, said Carpenter. I just love that it was giving the finger to Reagan when nobody else would. Released on November 4th, 1988, They Live was adapted from Ray Nelson's short story 8 O'Clock in the Morning by Carpenter and follows Roddy Piper's Nada, a homeless drifter who finds himself in Los Angeles, searching for a job and swept up in a conspiracy. Stumbling on a pair of special sunglasses, Nada sees the truth. Humanity has been overtaken by aliens who sit in positions of power, authority, and wealth exploiting the world and using subliminal messages to keep humanity under their thumb. With very few on his side, Nada sets out to wake up the world. They Live takes a science fiction approach to disillusionment, quite literally removing the illusions before our eyes to see the world as it truly is in black and white. No one would ever say that Carpenter's anarchic story is subtle in its messaging, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And with its anger toward power and the people that knowingly exploit everyone around them, They Live creates a pliable and sadly continually socially relevant social commentary that feels as alive today as it did more than 30 years ago. What was Carpenter originally trying to critique? How does a pro-wrestling man of the people and a high-concept satire collide? And what is the legacy of They Live? Dismissed by critics at the time and only doing okay at the box office, Carpenter's paranoid sci-fi action conspiracy thriller has continued to grow in stature over time. Today, They Live is an undeniable, angry political satire that's taken on a life of its own. John Carpenter directed eight films during the 1980s, building off the massive success of Halloween in 1978 to create a wide variety of genre-heavy films that, while extremely creative, never had the budgets he wanted. It was the thing in 1982 that saw the master of horror given his biggest financial investment yet at $15 million. But the movie's underwhelming box office performance and nasty critical backlash severely hurt Carpenter's career. In the aftermath, Carpenter was removed from pre-production on Universal's adaptation adaptation of the Stephen King novel Firestarter, with the director hired to work on another King adaptation, Christine, by another studio. Carpenter only sees Christine as a for-hire job, but I love it, and its solid performance led to Starman, Big Trouble in Little China, and Prince of Darkness afterward. And while I won't get too in-depth on these films because I could make a video on each of them, and probably will at some point, Carpenter's career never really set the box office on fire again. Each performed decently enough to ensure more work, but never guaranteed another blank check at a big studio. And it's here where we arrive at They Live, produced by Alive Films for $3 million, who also made Prince of Darkness. Carpenter had fully retreated from big studios, and in doing so, was both limited in what could be built, but completely free to make what he wanted. And this is a movie that really screams no studio oversight. They Live is messy. Its characters are unfinished. Its effects and cinematography are roughly hewn. No one could look at this film and say that it's a technical masterpiece. But its screenplay structure is perfect, and its messages and passions burn so hot that it's unforgettable. Carpenter is clearly criticizing the culture of excess and greed that had run rampant throughout the 80s, and the real-world struggles depicted in the film, especially in its first act, are serious business. But in execution, Carpenter isn't taking anything seriously. This is silly, sometimes campy, satire that uses sci-fi action as a way to blow off steam without dismissing its real concerns. Really, the Carpenter film that they live has most in common with is its opposite coast predecessor, Escape from New York. In his 1981 one film, Carpenter uses a freshly de-Disneyed Kurt Russell to play absolute stoic badass Snake Plissken, dropped into the worst place on Earth as the United States' escalating crime rate has pushed an authoritarian government to simply lock the problem behind an island-wide wall. 
New York is played much more seriously than they live. But the satire is still there, poking and prodding at governmental control and the denial of human rights beneath a gritty and extremely cool thriller. And much like the end of Nada's journey, we'll get there in a minute, the only solution is nihilistic destruction. Seven years later, Carpenter was done hiding the message. A lot of They Live was shot on location in Los Angeles, placing Nada's journey at the feet of corporate skyscrapers and around Skid Row, constantly reminding viewers of how the homeless and the powerful literally live side by side. And having the downtown LA skyline in view throughout the film not only adds a lot of production value to a clearly low-budget movie, but also keeps viewers' minds focused on Carpenter's critique, structures of power that tower over everyday life. But before we go any further, I need to talk about Rowdy Roddy Piper, who first met Carpenter at WrestleMania 3. Please allow me the increasingly common pro wrestling tangent. Piper's career began in the early 1970s, establishing himself as a major heel in every promotion he joined until becoming a star in the WWF in the 80s. And while Piper was fine in the ring, what set him apart from so many at the time was the way the guy could cut a promo. Piper was incredible on the mic with the recurring Piper's Pit segment showcasing his talent as both heel and face. And while professional wrestling is predetermined and choreographed, Piper always felt like a legitimate rough-and-tumble fighter thanks in part to his difficult upbringing, school expulsion, and exile from his family at an early age. At a time when crowds believed pro wrestling to be real, it took guts to get heat as a heel. Piper was merciless in riling up fans, and was even once stabbed in the crowd in 1982, leading to Piper getting his trademark custom-made stab-resistant jacket. There's a real-world weariness to Piper that automatically lands an authenticity to Nada's character. The years of bumps and countless gigs on the forehead right there on screen alongside his intimidating muscles. Nada, taking his name from the short story but never said a out here means nothing. But Piper's real-life adventures add the backstory through visuals. But despite not having anything to his non-existent name, Nada is still hopeful at the start of the film. I believe in America. I follow the rules. Everybody's got their own hard times these days. And while it's clear there's some sort of conspiracy behind the Justiceville homeless encampment and the church taking care of them, he's just trying to make his way. The moment that a massive police raid violently destroys the shanty town is where Nada is forced to confront the truth, putting on a pair of sunglasses from the destroyed underground resistance that allows him to see hidden messages everywhere, hear the constant broadcasts, and see the aliens hiding among us complete with very obvious, inexpensive masks to make their flayed bug skull appearance for cheap. The revelation dissuades Nada of any previous hope he had in the American Dream, a very fast change for a character that was on the opposite end of the spectrum, but it leads to a hell of a line. There are no <laughs> limits. We it must figures would be something like this. Keith David's Frank Armitage in some ways acts as the counterpoint to Nada. Whereas Nada at first believes in the promise of opportunity, Frank has seen too much corruption and disenfranchisement to have hope. And while Nada accepts the truth around him, Frank resists, leading to the film's infamous and honestly super awesome fight scene at its midpoint. Full of battered faces, realistic fatigue, sloppy punches, and dark humor. The sloppy beauty of They Live is that its famous fight scene can either be taken as an indulgent, quiet man inspired detour, or a metaphor for how the people at the bottom are too busy fighting each other to see how the powerful take advantage of them. Eventually, Frank and Nada are united in their cause fighting to make things right, and fed up with the resistance leaders who tell them to wait. Pro wrestling has always had a broad appeal to middle and lower class audiences. That's not to say anything negative about the sport or that anyone is barred from enjoying it, but there's something about it that appeals to the common people. This is the same appeal that They Live is working toward, focused on the poor, speaking about the middle class being disenfranchised, highlighting the church and people of color as those who already understand the issues plaguing humanity, and pointing at the upper class and powerful institutions as the perpetrators. They Live makes me think of another wrestler who spoke to the Steve was speaking directly to the people he knew were watching, and it solidified his place in wrestling history. And They Live is doing that too. Brother, life's a bitch. She's back in heat. Nada's awakening leads to a second act rampage, first out of self-defense when targeted by the cops, and then stumbling into a bank filled with aliens. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. 
Oh. And it's here where I think we need to be careful with how the metaphors of they live are applied to the real world. There have been too many mass shootings and too many crazed gunmen propelled by conspiracy theories and an ease of access to automatic weapons to dismiss the scarier parts of Carpenter's movie. Yes, They Live makes it clear that what Nada sees is real and not a delusion. But how many delusional people that went on a rampage also believed that the conspiracy theories, hateful worldviews, and mental health crises they experienced were also true? Thankfully, They Live quickly moves past its gun-toting spree and toward the fight against power. Still, the malleability of Carpenter's plot means that its anti-authoritarian stance has been co-opted by the worst of the worst forcing the director to speak out against anti-Semitic readings of the film. They Live is about yuppies and unrestrained capitalism, said Carpenter. It has nothing to do with Jewish control of the world, which is slander and a lie. When you mix a movie about sci-fi radicalization and real-world extremism, the result can be scary. In some ways, Nada has a lot in common with Carpenter's most famous creation, Michael Myers, with both arriving in a town as the mysterious and dangerous stranger inflicting sudden violence. But if the shape was the embodiment of evil lurking beneath the surface of our quiet everyday lives, that evil has been inverted in They Live, now lurking in everything except our Agent of Chaos. Nada peels back the surface to expose what's hiding underneath. Just as important, They Live embraces sci-fi, while Halloween is horror through and through. Horror, of course, is designed to scare us, but it also allows us to personify our fears and more easily confront them. An inoculation of sorts. Sci-fi, on the other hand, literalizes conflicts and concepts in the world until we cannot unsee them in reality, inspiring us in some instances and terrifying us in others. The sci-fi economic, societal, and political manipulation of this film considers what those in power might do with the world if given the chance with far-flung subliminal manipulation. Today, our constant inundation from media, agenda-driven news, and extremist conspiracy theories make They Live feel more like a documentary. But Carpenter's film was designed to speak to its time, and specifically the Reagan revolution that had dominated the US in the 80s. I hadn't watched much television over the years, but I began watching TV again, said Carpenter. I quickly realized that everything we see is designed to sell us something. My awareness became so acute after a while that I couldn't even watch MTV. It's all about wanting us to buy something. The only thing they want to do is take our money. I also looked around at movies. Most movies now are nothing more than television on a bigger screen. They have the same number of story climaxes, and they end the same way, with no uncertainty. Pretty soon, we'll all be programmed to pull out our wallets. Well, John, I hope you're not watching blockbusters in 2022. Carpenter keeps his big reveal hidden until the beginning of the film's second act. For the first 30 minutes, we're just as confused as Nada until a walk behind a pair of sunglasses shows our hero and the audience all the hidden messages around us and the aliens living among us. In some ways, having this sci-fi reveal is a relief. There's a specific enemy to destroy to rid us of our worst impulses. Otherwise, it would just be humans victimizing humans for some fleeting gain. You know, reality. And that's what makes the first act of They Live so terrifying. The militarized cops raiding Justiceville, destroying everything in sight and beating a blind black preacher they forced into resisting was always meant to reflect reality. It's just more chilling now when the reality is easier to see than ever. Really, the thing that's aged the most here is the use of television signals to indoctrinate. If They Live was made today, the alien influence would be impossible to escape. It would be on your computer, on your phone, coming out of every pocket. Distrust is a recurring theme throughout Carpenter's work. Distrust in a city's foundation in The Fog. Distrust in the government in Escape from New York. Distrust in your longtime friends in Christine. The Thing might be Carpenter's ultimate work of distrust. Fearing the person right next to you, and even your own body. But They Live is a close second, with lies permeating every part of culture. Late in the film, Carpenter adds a final wrinkle. It's not just the aliens that control the world, but the humans who work alongside them, knowing exactly what's happening and enabling it for their own financial gain. Really, who's worse? The creatures who subjugate those they deem lesser, or the people who sell out their fellow man? 
one of the great what-ifs of Carpenter's career. Besides getting the financial and critical success that he would only find decades later upon reappraisal, is the long-considered but never-realized western he always wanted to make. Carpenter cites Howard Hawks as his greatest inspiration, and Hawks' decades of work in westerns makes a clear impact on Carpenter's screenplay structures and panoramic lensing. There's western elements in so many Carpenter films, with Assault on Precinct 13 being a loose remake of Rio Bravo, a town on the edge of civilization seen in The Fog and The Thing, Lone Strangers Making a Difference found in Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China, and They Live, and Vampires being a Wild West horror story. To underline They Live's cowboy influence, Carpenter's score, while still mostly synced by Carpenter and Alan Howarth, is thumping and riding with harmonica adding an edge. Here, it's Nada who plays the John Wayne or Clint Eastwood role, and Los Angeles standing in for the dusty old town with a corruption that needs to be cut out. But Nada isn't the white hat sheriff with a heart of gold. He's just angry and ready to let it all out. There's a great irony at the center of They Live's story. Nada's life has no real purpose until he discovers that his entire country and its desires are purposeless, which then gives his life purpose. Nada goes from trying to kill every alien he sees, to trying to convince Frank to see what he sees, to joining the larger resistance movement, to eventually being its final hope of exposing the truth. You know, for all those complex plans and the need to build up a resistance, it's actually pretty easy to knock out the alien's transmission signal and bring the whole thing down. Again, They Live isn't perfect, and its third act is its weakest. By the end, Carpenter is propelling us into a final conflict. This is an action movie. There's no time to ruminate on the larger meaning of it all. We gotta get it on. Nada and Frank are pretty great at taking out legions of armed alien guards for two guys who've spent most of their lives breaking rocks for pennies. But you know what? At some point in life, you just get so fed up with the systems around you that you just want to see them come crashing down. And this entire movie is the story of being so completely disgusted with the world that you don't care what it takes. You just want it all to burn. Fuck it. Watching They Live Today can be a wild experience. Not in just the, holy shit, I can't believe you got away with making this, experience of how subversive it all is, but in how much still resonates. The mass media messaging, the cycle of consumerism and capitalism only really benefiting a few people, the agenda-driven news coverage pushing people into further and further extremes, the militarized police violence. With its exposed secret of they live, we sleep, you could say that they live is one of the original stay woke movies, taking a message of socio-political awareness and anger and turning it into a messy, raging fight for change. Ironically, They Live's iconography has been capitalistically co-opted in the years since, with artist Shepard Fairey mashing together the film's iconic message with Andre the Giant for Obey Clothing. Politically active corporations are still corporations after all, but so are politically active movie studios, so take that as you will. The most harmful, paranoid, hateful readings of They Live take a frustrated worldview and map it onto a specific conspiracy theory, something that imagines a secret cabal of the elite who have some all-encompassing plan to manipulate and destroy us. It's a fantasy that makes you feel like you're in the know, that you're special, that you've got it all figured out and now you, just you, have the power. In reality, we're all subject to some form of manipulation. Everybody wants a slice, and every company, group, or person with enough power is trying to leverage the insights they have on you. That's not a conspiracy, that's just being honest about how businesses work. They kinda tell you up front these days. In these last few years, I've found myself losing trust in more and more institutions, groups, and entire worldviews. At least the little amount of trust I still had. This isn't something I wanted to happen, but it's something that did. I think part of growing older is losing faith in a lot of the world that you took for granted as being good or at least on the path toward getting better. It's realizing why people older than you seem so cynical and so damn tired all the time. And then thinking about what in this world you actually care about. The reasons you fight. The people you would lay your life down for. And remembering that even if the larger world can't change, protecting the lives of the people you love, even if it costs you everything, is worth it. What will happen after Nada has destroyed the signal? Is change possible? Where do you go when you stop believing the lies you've been raised on? One thing is certain. Once your eyes are open, they can't be closed again.
Thanks for watching today's video. Hey, this one's a little political, huh? Well, I guess that's what happens when you talk about They Live. Honestly, you can't possibly talk about this movie without delving into its messages, its relevance, its politics, because it's all there baked into this movie. And you can talk about it in the context of its time, but also we are watching this movie in 2022 at the time of this video's recording. So you also can't divorce it from the many years that followed. I think that They Live is really fascinating because while it is extremely entertaining and silly and cheesy and campy, its political and social message feel really, really pointed. I've rewatched this movie many, many times over the years, and there's some scenes in this movie that just hit me so hard this last time. It was kind of wild to see. So I really wanted to make this video, and I really couldn't make this video without talking about all those aspects of this film. You could make a video that just talked about the fight scene, which is awesome and glorious and silly and really worth the reputation that it has. But then you'd be ignoring everything that happens in this movie around that scene, and the reasons why that scene is in the movie. And if you were upset about me being very political and socially conscious in this video, I'm sorry, but I always have been in these videos. Sometimes it just kind of flies over people's heads. This is the latest video that I made about a John Carpenter movie, and there will be many, many more to come. I gotta make at least one John Carpenter video every year. There's a lot of candidates for what the next one could be, but Escape from New York and Christine are probably higher on my list of priorities. And also this video got me to talk more about pro wrestling, which I love. And it was actually relevant to the video this time. I'd love to hear your thoughts on They Live, the way that its legacy has continued on over the years, and where you would place it in the larger filmography of John Carpenter. It's not my favorite, but I think it's really fascinating. And as always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. If you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews. And until next time, I hope that you're either putting on these glasses or starting to eat that trash can. See you again soon.